Hi, my name is Charlie Yap. I'm one of the sales application engineer here in Altium. And today, I'll be actually discussing a couple of things about Altium designers' best practices. Uh, more specifically, using the schematic to provide design intent with net classes, rules, and impact on PCB layout of schematic directives and PCB planning. Um, this is to kind of ensure and also identify the hazards of class creation in PCB instead of schematics, right? Because a lot of companies, um, they tend to hire contractors to do the layout for them. But sometimes they also struggle with communication due to the lack of the schematic designer conveying the message on how rules and constraints are defined in PCB. And also, many larger companies, there's a discrete group that performs layout that is independent of the design groups and that communication is a significant factor within the same organization's independent group, right? Um, we're going to actually probably discuss the agenda uh, as well as know the bare, bare minimum requirements on how to get things done in Altium and maybe later on be dangerous enough to be proficient in using the tool. So the first thing that we're going to discuss is probably just the agenda. Why define rules in the schematic, right? And then followed by the hierarchical or flat design. Uh, this is actually one of the most uh, classic question. Like some companies would say, yeah, they prefer using the flat. And some companies, they are very strict about using hierarchical design. And we'll actually talk about this because this is actually one of the most important stepping stone in order for you to use directives later on, right? And then if you actually decided to go for the hierarchical design, what is the top-down method or the bottom-up? Uh, we're not going to try to uh, spend much time in the top-down and bottom-up because this is one of the uh, most straightforward classical steps in design, right? And we're going to discuss the multiple ways in creating design rules in Altium. Uh, we'll try to revisit stuff from the PCB and maybe learn a thing or two about some of the functionalities that a lot of people don't use. Right? And then finally, we'll teach you how to use the schematic directives in Altium Designer. Right? So without further ado here, let's proceed with our first topic, which is why define rules in schematic. When you're defining rules in the schematic, so for example, I'm just going to grab a random project here. This is a project where it contains a bunch of different nets here. And if you're trying to de define or create a rule in the PCB without looking at the schematic, it's almost assuming that you already know every single net coming in and coming out of this part. This part has a lot of components. Imagine maybe around more than 50 pins here. And you want to make sure that every single net coming out from bank 2 is being assigned in a net class, also covered in a specific rule in the PCB. right? So rather than memorizing HB 5, 8, 7, 10, 9, and 12, and then jump into the PCB here, you know, besides, you know, going to the PCB, you first have to define this a, as a net class. And you have to define each of the net that should be belonging to that group and then assign that group later on. It's really hard. And there's also a very common um, method where a company will hire a layout designer. However, this layout designer might not, you know, they're basically the artists of the circuit or the whole PCB. And they might not have a very strong background on, let's say, RF design, where certain components or certain nets should comply on certain, certain spacing, or you need to actually apply certain um, rules on the internal power planes and so on. Okay. So it is actually better because the, the schematic or the schematic designer, they're the brains of the operation here. They want to convey the message that, hey, I already know that these specific, let's say, if there's going to be a high um, high impedance net, and I know the nets here in the schematic based on my design, I can just assign this later on with the directives and push it to the PCB, rather than telling the 
layout artist, um, which net needs to be part of what rule. Okay. All right. So now we're going to discuss the, you know, what is a hierarchical design and what is a flat design. So hierarchical design means that you, ha you normally have a top level sheet and you have this um, sub schematics that falls underneath it. And ideally, these uh, top level sheet are represented by what they call sheet symbol. And these sheet symbol represent a specific uh, schematic document. It's almost like a subway map, right? When you look at a schematic page here, and this is being represented by one, two, three, four subschematic. So when you look at the left side here, one, two, three, four, we have four subschematics here. You can easily just say, I want to go to the FPGA here. So if I hold the control and then double left mouse click, I should be able to access the uh, the page here. And if you want to jump back or maybe just look at the uh, uh, where where the specific uh, net goes by, you can um, you can trace back by holding the control double click again, and it will go to the top level, telling you that this is the port that originate from that FPG and it's connected to this net here so if you're trying to connect to a header um, it pretty much just tells you where this is being connected from one place to another right I find this method very uh, efficient especially if you are the brains of the operation here let's say you are the architect of the uh, the design here and you want to assign certain blocks because some of your colleagues specialize on specific uh, aspect of design. So let's say one is a power engineer and one is more on the FPGA expert and some of them will be the digital designer here. So you can create blocks and save, you know, save the, uh, the blocks here as an empty shell and let them um, build their design from there. Or if they want to create more sub-levels like a sub-schematic within a sub-schematic and a sub-schematic, the world is your oyster, right? So that is actually the beauty about a hierarchical design. Compared to the flat design here, if your design is basic, not really basic, but I would say not so complicated where you have to involve separate, several different aspects of the tool or the schematic design, then a flat design would suffice your needs. So in this example here, uh, this flat design has one page for this ginormous um, connector, right? And on the next page here, maybe a bunch of different uh, terminal resistors. Not really a big, de big deal. And then the memory ICs and more memory ICs and then the power coupling, right? So this one does not really uh, demand a very complex um, map. Of the whole entire design so this is actually um, you can easily just use this as a flat design right so LTM normally has the um, auto identifier whether the design has to be a hierarchical or a flat design so that's being set here in the net identifier scope by default it's always set to automatic you know what that means is if a user places a port in the design it's assuming that this is going to be a flat design. But the moment you, you introduce a sheet symbol in the design, this automatically translates the design to a hierarchical design. All right, so that's the purpose of the automate. Or if you really want to be strict here, where I know, like, let's say I'm, I'm the kind of engineer that loves to cut, cut corners in the company because I don't want to follow the hierarchical design, you can actually set this in place to become a hierarchical design where a sheet entry must be present in order for the compiler to report properly, right? Uh, another you know, var variant of the hierarchical design is what they call the strict hierarchical design where the power ports are local while the other hierarchical is the power ports are global, which it actually exists in many ways, right? So now we actually discussed the difference in the hierarchical design and the flat design. Uh, let's talk more about the hierarchical design because there's at least two different um, style and how to approach a hierarchical design. 
Uh, the first one is what we called a top-down, right? Uh, the top-down method, method is a natural way to approach a complex design task, right? You know, because the human imagination can be as vast as the ocean. Right? We can have so many different ideas, but the human mind can only handle a limited number of concepts at one given time, right? We're not built like a multiprocessor CPU where we can think and do multiple tasks all at the same time. Right. Sometimes we have to focus on one aspect of the design here and move along with that. Right. So imagine you are the architect of the design and you want to define the work based on what area of focus each page should be. Um, that's the purpose of this top level design. That being said, um, when a user wants to perform the top down approach, um, in this example here, I just place some sheet symbol because I think a LCD, a power and a config config file um, should be in place and let's try to add another one this is where my FPGA is going to be right? so I'll place this box here and I'll name this as the FPGA All right and if you want to create sub-level schematic sheets here um, you can, let's say you have a general idea, you have not defined the entire uh, ports that's coming in or coming out of the design. Uh, we can just put maybe, okay, so I put input here, and for here I'll put output. And if you're dealing with digital design, the IO type is very important. So say output should be an output port, and input Uh, sheet entry should be an input port. Okay, so once you're uh, done with this, what we can do is right click on the sheet symbol and go to the sheet symbol action, and we can create a sheet based from the schematic sheet symbol. Right. So now that's where the new file name will be generated with the ports that's already provided for this user here. So let's say I'm going to assign it to person A. Person A, you are um, you know, you're going to be in charge of performing this task here. Now, let's say I'm going to copy a file here. I'm going to copy this FPGA. Maybe just the component itself. And let's just say I slab this component here for now. Um, it's a little bit too small, so let's try to increase the size of my workspace here. Let's use maybe size B. I think size B will be large enough for us to fit this large component. Now, maybe this is a perfect chance for us to learn a couple of uh, neat tricks in Altium. And suppose you just place this FPGA here and your goal here is to create a bunch of um, wires with ports. All right? So you can actually transfer the um, information back to the top level. What I normally do here is I just intentionally create a duplicate copy of this component. And after um, creating a duplicate copy here, there is a section uh, option here that you can change the part and convert the part into a sheet symbol. Now, a lot of people might argue, why do you not convert it to a port? I think port is a lot easier to do this. So this net here will just automatically get transferred to a port. The problem with that is, let's say this pin here is a input pin. When you convert this, into a port. This port here, instead of an input uh, input port, it becomes an output. So in, in other words, it was the reverse of the direction. So that might not be the case. So if your um, goal here is to ensure that if it's an input pin, you want it to be a input uh, port, 
you will convert this into a sheet symbol instead. Okay. You know, technically, you can just um, place the component on the top level schematic, right? And then convert that component into a sheet symbol. And your goal here is this this specific uh, sheet is dedicated to that component, right? And this component here should have all the ports uh, necessary. But in this example here, I'm going to show you another technique, which is, in my opinion, one of my most favorite um, approach in schematic. Like, if you know how to do this, in my opinion, this is like the 80% uh, knowledge of the entirety of the schematic experience in Altium, right? So what I'm going to do here is I will just select the sheet entries on the right side of this design, all right? Which is this portion here. And I will perform a copy. And instead of your traditional paste, I will use the smart paste, okay? The smart paste is one of Altium's, I would say, most useful tool where you can convert a single object into something else or more than the original, right? So this is the sheet entries here. And my goal is to create, convert the names of the sheet entries plus the direction of the sheet entries to ports, wires, and that label. So by doing so, I should be able to place this directly. And don't mind the mess here right now, but let me just Try to place this as accurate as possible and delete this sheet symbol. And I think plus, let me move some of the nets here to make it cleaner. There we go. So that's how easy it is to just create a duplicate copy of the component, convert the component to a sheet symbol, and you select the uh, the sheet entries on one side of the uh, the component and convert them to wires, net labels, and ports. Right. I'm going to save this and call this as the FPG. And then from here, you know, you notice that the information is from the original. It's just input and output. Now, there's a way in Altium where you can just synchronize the entries or the ports that exist here in FPJ. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to tell the sheet symbol that this sheet symbol represents the FPGA schematic document. All right? And after that, we should be able to use the synchronized sheet entries and port. And Altium should be able to tell you that, hey, these are the ports that exist in the schematic document. However, this is the one that exists on your top level sheet. Uh, would you like to synchronize them? It's like, yeah, we want to add the sheet entries and ports here, like so. Uh, we'll just put it on the right side for now, even though it's a little bit congested, it's okay. Okay, and this one should not be there because we're, we're not using input and output uh, sheet entries anymore. So we'll just delete that. That pretty much uh, completes the top level approach, right? Now let's move to the the next part, which is the bottom up approach, right? That being said, that the top level here. So let me just delete this. Uh, the top level normally starts empty or blank. All right, so let's save this file first and. Let's say in this example, we have a USB 3.0 device, right? And I can actually use the same exact technique where we're going to use ports, wires, and that label. Oops. Oh, yeah. So I need to copy the component first. And from the component, we'll convert this into, um, since there's no input or output pins here, I think it's safe for us to just convert this to port, which is fine. And then I will perform the smart paste because now I'm copying port. And I would like to convert this into ports, wire, and label. Okay. 
So once you're com we're done with the, uh, the the bottom level, we're going to the top, and from the top, we can just perform the uh, the sheet action, and or part action or place. We're gonna put the. Oh, sorry. I can just go to the sheet symbol here. Create sheet symbol from a sheet. Okay. And we're going to use the USB 3.0. Uh, it's going to have document here. And you are done. All right. This is actually very ideal if you know that every single port is going to be connected to, let's say, different blocks. So let's say you have four different blocks here on the, uh, on the, like sheet symbols, right? So let's say one, two, three, and then four. And each of those um, sheet entries are going to its respective uh, place. However, if you want to just connect this USB 3.0 to, let's say, a single page here, right? There's a way for you to save space by um, combining all of these ports here into a single port, and that's what we called a harness or signal harness. Because the USB 3.0 is usually going to a specific page, and these are normally grouped up. So instead of using ports here, what I'm going to do is use the harness connector. I'm going to place it here like so. All right. And the next thing here is I'm gonna use the smart paste to smart paste the um, the nets, and I would like to convert them to harness entries. Okay, and now all of these different nets will be condensed down. Uh, we'll call this the USB 3.0. Now place the port. So we'll just connect it here to the tip. And voila, right? The US, in my opinion, the signal harness is very useful uh, because you cannot just use normal ports if you're using um, different nets of different net names. But if it's a bus, right? Let's say LED1 all the way to LED32. Uh, they have the same exact um, name. But the only thing different here is the number of the variable for each of the and the net. If it's a bus net, then you can just use normal ports. But if you try to want to combine nets of different names, or you can also even combine signal harness to a signal harness, and that's where the signal harness becomes very useful. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I know that I'm using the signal harness from the bottom level. So we're going to synchronize this because it knows that we're using this USB 3.0 uh, signal harness. And once you place it here and you notice that the port is colored blue, indicating to you that this is a signal harness and you are good to go. And that's one of the most important basic fundamentals in schematic. All right. Now we, we Finally, revisited all the most important parts in our um, experience here. We are now moving forward to the uh, the PCB or the design rule, right? So a little bit um, more of a refresher here. You know, what are design rules? You know, design rules target specific object and are applied in a hierarchical fashion. So, for example, there is a clearance rule for the entire board. Okay. Then perhaps a clearance rule for a class of nets. Then perhaps another for one in pads in the class. Using rule priority and the scope, the PCB editor and the PCB uh, section can determine which rule applies to each object in the design. If a user has a well-defined set of design rules, you can successfully complete the board design with varying and often um, stringent design requirements. Uh, additionally, since the PCB editor is rules-driven, 
Taking time to set up the rules at the beginning of the design will enable you to effectively get on with the job of the design. Safe in the knowledge that the rules system is working hard to ensure that success. Right? So when you, you know, normally sometimes people get too excited jumping into the PCB and later on when they find out like, oh, I shouldn't be using this type of um, width on this net. There's no way for you to, I mean, there's a way for you to expand the, the net, but that will generate um, a bunch of violation. And you don't want that. You always want to set the rules first before laying anything in the PCB. That is also, there's always like the rule of thumb in any PCB design, all right? So a couple of things, let's try to revisit, you know, what are the different ways in creating rules in LTM, right? So number one, uh, let's try to open a different project here. I will open my favorite, which is our reference design, the Bluetooth Sentinel. All right, let's open this PCB file. So the first as, and the most direct way in defining design rules in Altium is just go to the PCB here and access the design rules. I'm sure that you guys have any experience with the PCB here. This is like the first thing that a lot of people go. Um, just go to the clearance rule, for example, and always remember to always have the all all rule or catch all rule at the very end. Because if you just have a you know no all rule at the very bottom of the priority list. It assumes that you are fine to not have any clearance rule set in place in the design, right? You don't want that. You always want to have a buffer to catch every uncategorized rule or undefined rule not to fall into a category, right? So we're not going to talk much here because this is already a fundamental or a essential uh, topic that you should know when you're dealing with design. Uh, next one here is, you know, a lot of people don't use this because they are not aware that you can combine the PCB filter. Uh, this is what we called the try before you apply kind of rule. Because in the design rule, it just assumes that you already know what specific group, objects, entity that you want to apply. But here, this is a good way to uh, create a query first. And once you define the query, uh, you will it will display a preview of what you're trying to look for. And if this is good, then you can begin creating the rule based on what was uh, filtered here. Okay. So there's multiple ways. I'm going to show you for um, the most, um, I would say, the easiest way. If you're a beginner and you have absolutely no idea what the query language are, um, this is like turning the English language into a computer language. And that's through the find similar object, right? So the find similar object, it's a menu where it's going to tell you, all right, what are you trying to look for, right? By default, it will, uh, it will set this to same on the object that you right click first, and it will give you all the properties of that object. So in this example, we have a track. What are you looking for? A track that exists on mid-layer 2? Sure, I want to set that up. And if you want to target a very specific net, then set this to same. But for now, I just want to target every single traces that exist in mid-layer 2. Okay. Uh, another thing here is I would like to mask the result and only traces that mid-layer 2 um, will only be displayed while the rest will be masked out. I also, another important recipe here, and by default, when you install Altium, this is always set to disabled. Uh, enable this create expression here because this will populate the computer language in the filter once you're done with the film similar objects. Okay. So we're ready to run this through. We'll just hit OK. And that selected every single track that exists in mid layer 2. It's like, oh, this is a result. I like this result here. 
And based on the result, I would like to now move forward by applying a set of rules. So if you just click the rule here, and Alex is going to ask you what type of rule are you going to um, set this in place. I would like to perform a width constraint. Okay. And this width constraint here is like, okay, what values of um, track do you want this to be? Uh, let's say everything here has to be 0.15. And I think when I apply this 0.15 to each of this um, min, preferred, and max, it should result a, a violation because I'm pretty sure that the net or the, the width here is not to code, right? So when you actually apply this, uh, you know what? Let me double check. This is 0.1, okay? So if I try to run the design rule check here, I should be re uh, receiving, a, there's a bunch of like with constraint. It's telling you, okay, let's try to understand what's being reported here. There's a with constraint violation, or I always like to use this menu here called the uh, uh, PCB rules and violation. In my opinion, this should be the bread and butter for any, whether you're the uh, schematic designer or the PCB designer, if you have just a schematic uh, only version of Altium, you can still run the PCB rules and violation to check any error that occurs in the, uh, the design, right? So I know that I should have some width constraint uh, violation because if I double click this, this menu will appear and it tells you what the violation is. First of all, the rule that's being violated, it's called the width underscore one. I can be more creative here by saying width uh, mid layer two because the min, max, and the preferred is 0.15 on all categories. However, the value here, the actual width is currently 0.1, right? I create an absolute range or absolute value that has to be 0.15, otherwise throw an error. And that's what happened here, right? So you can see how easy it is to just use the PCB filter in order for you to apply the rules. It is a very uh, pretty good way to use this as an exercise because mm -hmm. later on, once we revisit to the schematic, uh, it kind of it kind of wants you to have a basic idea or knowledge of the, uh, the the PCB rules and how it works. Okay. All right. Now this is you know the fine segment object is the very first I would say the easiest level of understanding rules. Uh, the next one is called the helper. So this is like the encycl encyclopedia for every single command that occurs or that you can type in here in the filter, right? So if you said back drill bottom, there's a description here. It'll tell you what each of this uh, query command would do. This is more for advanced, uh, for advanced user. Now for beginners who are trying to train themselves be more proficient in this filter here other than the uh, fine similar object, you want to use the builder. The builder is build your English sentence and it will convert into a computer query preview, right? So what the condition here is, you know, you just apply a condition. Uh, let's say it belongs to a net. And when you select this belongs to the net, it will display to you every single net that exists in the design, right? So let's say I want to use ground for now. Now you can add another condition here. You know, what other, uh, other condition would you like? I want the object to be, uh, let's say only vias, right? And if you have uh, experience with, you know, like uh, digital design, there's the logic and an or, okay? So in this example here, the net has to be a ground and it must be a via. The query language will automatically convert this in net ground and is view. So once you're done with that, you can even apply this, right? And you notice that everything will be grayed out. It's like, oh, this is a preview of my, um, you know, this is the preview of my query here. And if you are happy with this approach, then you can now create the rule like so, just like the, um, the previous example that I just shown. Okay, very good. Now, 
we are actually done with the um, this approach here. Now it's the time for us to apply what we've learned so far to the schematic. So this is where I'm going to change hat. Instead of use, uh, being the layout designer here, I am now the electrical engineer that is in charge of the schematic design. I would like to push this information to my layout engineer uh, without fiddling around with the PCB file. Right? You want um, to provide this information. The moment the layout engineer imports all your schematic design to the PCB, the rules are already been set in place for them. So the first thing that you have to do here is go to the uh, project option. Okay. And you always want to look at the, uh, the class generation here. This is one of the few things that a lot of people um, neglect or don't understand what this class generator is all about. By default, Altium will automatically create component class. Uh, these are, you know, components being grouped together based from the origin of the schematic document that they were used on. Okay. Another thing is this generate rooms. We'll talk about this generate rooms. Um, usually, rooms for beginners are the bane of every layout engineer's existence. But I think this is one of the few misunderstood powerful feature in Altium. Right. So we'll definitely uh, jump back to the uh, rooms later on, but I just want you to understand the component classes here. Um, it says here we will generate some net classes if a bus is present in the schematic. And most of these are, you know, bus section, signal harness, like some people would prefer signal harness. Let's say, remember the USB 3.0. Uh, if we want to apply that, then you can create those net class or generate net class for components, uh, whichever you want. But I, the goal here for now is I just want to generate net class based on um, a feature called directives in Altium, right? Another thing here is to make sure to go to the comparator tab and double check if the difference associate nets, you know, sometimes or by default, all of these are enabled, but in this design here, whoever the user was, they disabled the uh, comparison of the nets in the schematic and versus the PCB. So make sure that all of these nets are enabled, otherwise this method will not work. Right? So my, my goal here is I want this nets starting from DQ probably zero and DM zero all the way to DQ, whatever this highlighted area here. I want these to be grouped as a specific net class. And there's multiple ways to do this. Okay. We're going to use the directives here called the parameter set. It's like a lollipop and what I'm going to do here is call this label, um, let's say the D, DQ first batch, right? That's the name or the label I'm going to put. And next thing is I'm going to put a net class and I'll just say DQ one. That's the name of my net class. So anything that I place this lollipop or this um, directive, uh, this will apply or group them up in a net class called DQ first batch. All right, so I'll just apply this real quick. All right, I'll just apply this for now, the, uh, the right side. So once I'm done with the right side here and everything looks good, I can update the PCB here by pushing that information. And now it will tell you that, hey, we're about to add the, these net class here. So right now, the only DQ1 is the one that I really care about. Um, remember, the in the project option, I did not uncheck the net class or the, uh, the yeah the net class for a sheet uh, for, for the pages. 
right? But for now, I'll just uncheck that and just say, I would just want to push the DQ1. I'll execute that changes. And when you're here in the PCB, when you visit the net class, DQ1, it involves DM0, double zero, 0, 02, 04, and 06. So if we actually look at the, uh, the right side here, the DM0, double O, 02, 04, and 06, right? So this is actually, this method here is very useful. If, um, if the nets are scattered all around and you want to ensure that they should be part of one net class. But another easier way to do this is, you know, you can actually use what they call the blanket. And the blanket will cover, you know, anything that it touches will be part of this uh, net class group. So what I'm going to do here is maybe copy this directive again and attach it here. So whatever the tip of this directive touches and this blanket here um, covers all of these nets, these nets will now be part of the DQ1 uh, net class. And the, the cool thing about this blanket here is you can uh, enable it or disable it on the fly. So let's say you don't want the net class to be pushed. You can just uh, click here, but if you want to enable it, just click it here. And next time we update the PCB, this will tell you that, hey, we're about to add this new net to our net class to DQ1. Right? Again, I still don't want to include okay, the uh, sheet one to sheet number five. And when you're happy with that, we'll execute the changes. So if we try to revisit the, the classes here, classes should be able to distinguish, you know, DM0 and then a bunch of DQ from 00 all the way to 07, even the, uh, the differential pair. Right? So that is creating a net class. You can also create a component class if you want. If that you know group of components should belong to a specific uh, component class. <clears throat> now, the the next part here is now we know how to um, create this net class. The next thing here is can we apply rules to this following nets from DQ00 all the way to DQ07? And that's the, that's the value of using this directive here. You can actually apply multiple different um, commands other than just net class. You can go here and apply a PCB rule, right? So that's the reason why I had to um, probably discuss design rule first as a refresher course. And now you should be able to see like, oh yeah, it started to make sense because I tested the query uh, earlier in using the PCB filter, and it looks great. And now I would like to apply a width constraint to this group, group of nets, All right? And I would like to say these nets should have a five mil. Okay, so this one uh, worked great, but I think if you if you edit this, you might have to edit. You have to edit the uh, the rest of the directives here as well. So the easiest way to do this is just delete them, and then apply or paste the uh, the new newly updated directives like so. That's why there is a huge advantage using blanket because you don't have to individually place this directive to each of this net, but rather as long as it's currently highlighted, then you should be able to apply this rule. So let's test it. We're going to go to the update PCB. And everything is done by the um, schematic designer. And you can see that there is a rule added to this width constraint in that class DQ. One. Okay. So when you actually go here, and let's say I'll just grab a random pad or place a random pad. 
and then I will set the net here to DQ double O, uh, which is part of the uh, net class. And if we try to route this net here, let's go to the bottom. If we confirm this, let's change it to uh, Q, which is in mils. This is now 5 mil, which is the rule that was applied from the schematic. Okay? So hopefully everyone understands the importance of and the technique in defining rules in the schematic. And one bo bonus topic here that I would like to uh, discuss is the room definition. Okay, like I said, rooms are one of the few uh, few things that a lot of people neglect in Altium, but it is actually one of the few misunderstood uh, feature yet powerful feature in existence. So suppose that I'm gonna grab a different board here. So in this board, I will try to remove the polygon pores. Okay, now I'll set all layers here. And then let's go to the top layer. First thing I'm gonna do here is place a room. I don't know why I can't place a room here, but let's try a different page. Shell the polygon, go to the top layer, go to design, place a room. All right. So we have a room here called, let's give it a, um, let's just say we're planning to put a BGA in this room here. Okay. The next thing here is I would like anything within the BGA room to have a special rule here. Okay, so I just created this rule. This area here is can now be a area specific dev, uh, defined design rule. So I would like to create a rule here. Let's delete this one for now. Because our general rule for all the uh, traces is currently um, let's just say 0.5 mils to or 0.1 on the width and maximum 0.5 but if we have a, um, a trace that goes within the inside perimeter of this room here let's do a custom query within room BGA I want the trace to automatically get converted to one millimeter a big fat uh, trace while the rest of the trace outside the room will be between 0.1 to 0.5 millimeter. Right? So let's try to place this interactive routing here. We start our trace here and let's try to confirm it's currently 0.1 and as we approach this uh, this area here notice that it will automatically change the moment it passes through the room. right? This, is a, this application is really powerful if you're dealing with BGA. It's almost like if you have to force a neck down from a five, I mean from a 10 mil to a five mil trace, just place your room here and everything will follow through. Okay. And that is it for the, um, the room plus the idea of defining schematic rules from or design the rules from the schematic and being pushed to the PCB. Again, my name is Charlie Yap and I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you for attending Altium Live 2022. Till then, bye.